Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is um, described as a special lunchtime talk, and I don't know how many of you have read Eric Schloss's book, but you'll know it's going to be, it is going to be special. Uh, my name's Roderick Braithwaite. I was in the British Foreign Service, and now I spend my time writing things, and I'm here to introduce Eric, who's a an investigative journalist, an author, a documentary and feature film producer. And what he's here today is, is to talk about his latest book, which is this book, which is available for sale afterwards, and I strongly advise all of you, um, called Command and Control, and it's up for a Pulitzer Prize. And the thing that I liked about this book is that it's not addressed to my generation, it's addressed to the present or the new, younger generation. The people, as he says in his introduction, who grew up, who were raised without experiencing the dread and anxiety of the Cold War, ended 20 years ago more. And it was a period which uh, we lived through and felt, which did actually threaten to kill us all. And it also, and that does speak to my generation, is about the extent to which the people who were managing the Cold War, particularly the people who were managing the nuclear weapon, were wise enough and competent enough to control what they were doing. And the thing about this book is it's full of the most amazingly researched information about the weapons, about the ways of controlling them, about the things that went wrong, and a lot of things went wrong, and um, about this confrontation in which we were trapped. I don't think you have to assume that anybody on either side was evil. We were landed with this stuff, and we survived primarily, I think, through good luck, not through good judgment. Now, the Cold War is over, but a lot of those weapons are still there, and they are spreading to all sorts of new people. And so Eric is going to talk about the risks we then faced and the risks we face today. And he'll talk for about 20 minutes. And then we'll, he and I will have a talk. And then we'll open the thing out for discussion. And could you all remember to do what I quite often forget to do, which is turn off your phones, because this is going to be recorded, this session. And something which I religiously don't do, but you probably know what I'm talking about, even if I don't, and that is that you can Twitter later, after, if you want to. And there's a hashtag, and the hashtag is, is, is I don't know what the cross thing is called in the English version. Hash. Yeah, hash. R-S-A Schlosser, spelt with a C-H. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Well, thank you very much for coming today. And I'm very honored to be invited to speak here at the Citadel of the Enlightenment. Uh, certainly the subject that I'm going to talk about, nuclear weapons, is one that for almost 70 years has been shrouded in fear and emotion and a remarkable amount of unreason. And in my investigation, what I try to do is cut through the symbolism, the myths, the emotions surrounding these weapons and look at them clearly for what they are, which are machines. Uh, when you think about man-made machines, it's very hard to name one that doesn't eventually go wrong. Uh, toaster ovens catch on fire, and burn down lovely homes. Uh, automobiles, which are amongst the most widely used means of transportation, break down on a regular basis. Commercial, airline, uh, uh, commercial airliners are perhaps the safest means of transportation that exist. And yet a major commercial airliner vanished this past year we still have no idea where it is. One of the most sophisticated planes that Boeing has ever built. 
Now, when one of these machines goes wrong, and tragically wrong, there's a limit to the scope of the tragedy. Uh, when an airliner goes down because of some mechanical glitch, the victims are the passengers and the loss is felt by their families. That's a tragedy, but it, it, it's limited to a few hundred or a few thousand people. Uh, some of these airline disasters are because of very unexpected things. There was a Swiss air flight in the 1990s that went down over the Atlantic, and there was a fire in the cockpit. Uh, they knew there was a fire in the cockpit down on the ground, the, the air controllers. When they eventually did the investigation into the cause of the Swiss air crash, it was found there had been a short circuit in the in-flight entertainment system. And the short circuit in the in-flight entertainment system had led to a fire. Now, when the well-intended engineers were designing that airplane, the last thing they ever could have imagined would be that a system designed to entertain the passengers would kill every one of them. And I bring up these issues in designing machines effectively because nuclear weapons are machines. They are the most dangerous machines ever invented. And they don't exist in isolation. They're connected to other machines, like missiles, bombers, which are connected to other machines, communications systems. And what you get is an incredibly complex technological system. And one of the realizations I came to during the research on my book is that human beings are much better at creating complex technological systems than we are at controlling them or understanding them or knowing what to do about them when something goes wrong. So the title of my book is Command and Control. And the subject matter is the effort by the United States government to control its own nuclear weapons from the dawn of the atomic era to the present day. And by control them, I don't mean through diplomacy, arms control talks. I mean literally control these weapons. Make sure that they don't detonate by accident. Make sure that they can't be sabotaged or stolen or used by one of our own officers without the permission of the President of the United States. It's remarkable when you look closely at this history how difficult it's been to control our arsenal for almost 70 years. And I tried very hard not to make this a book about good guys and bad guys and evil warmongers because I interviewed many of them. I interviewed people who were in charge of our nuclear command and control system. They were well-intended, they were patriotic, and yet they themselves felt throughout the Cold War that this enormous system was always just on the verge of slipping outside of anyone's control with potentially catastrophic effects. And that feeling of this technology on the verge of being out of control was present from the very, very beginning. If you go back to July of 1945 to the desert in New Mexico where the first nuclear device was going to be tested as part of the Trinity test, you had some of the most brilliant scientific minds of the world assembled there from the United States, from Great Britain, European emigres. And as the test was coming close, uh, to being performed, there was a genuine concern that the detonation of the world's first nuclear device would set the atmosphere on fire and kill every living thing on Earth. So the Manhattan Project scientists did mathematical calculations for one year to see if a nuclear detonation would set the Earth's atmosphere on fire. Now, the physicist Hans Beth completely dismissed the possibility. 
Uh, but the physicist Enrico Fermi, a Nobel uh, Prize winner, thought that the odds were maybe one in 10 that the atmosphere would catch on fire. And no one was sure if he was joking or not. They were seriously concerned about it. And the, the physicist Edward Teller, who later, later became known as the father of the hydrogen bomb, he was involved in these calculations. They decided to do the test. And there was another physicist who later became quite prominent, Victor Weisskopf. Victor Weisskopf had spent much of the year performing these calculations. At 5.30 in the morning, when they decided to detonate the first world's first nuclear device, Victor Weisskopf was sp standing 10 miles away from the shot tower. And he saw this brilliant white flash. And at a distance of 10 miles, he felt intense heat on his face. And in that moment, he was convinced they'd been wrong. The atmosphere was on fire and every living thing on Earth was about to die. Thankfully, he was incorrect. But that sense of anxiety, that sense of not quite being sure that we have this under control, has literally persisted to this day. Uh, within a decade of the Trinity test, and the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by atomic bombs, the United States had devised a hydrogen bomb. And these hydrogen bombs could be thousands of times more powerful than an atomic bomb. It's worth keeping in mind that the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima contained about 144 pounds of weapons-grade uranium. And it was such a crude and inefficient weapon that when it detonated, 98 to 99% of that uranium didn't even undergo fission. It was just blown apart uselessly in the air. About 1.5, 1.6% of the uranium actually underwent fission and created uh, all kinds of other radioactive elements. But the amount of uranium that became pure energy was about 7 tenths of a gram of uranium. And again, this is in a very crude weapon. And this is what I like to do to demonstrate what a crude weapon can do. This weighs more than 7 tenths of a gram of uranium. So when something that weighs less than a, a, a bill, a, a piece of currency, when that turned into pure energy over Hiroshima, 80,000 people died instantly, and 2 thirds of the buildings in a major metropolitan area were destroyed. Within a decade, we had hydrogen bombs that made the Hiroshima bomb seem trivial. And when we were testing one of our first devices that was going to be like a deliverable hydrogen bomb, uh, there were scientists involved in the test 30 miles away from the detonation. This was the Bravo test. They saw a fireball on the horizon getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they were suddenly terrified because the, high, the, the fireball was getting far larger than they had ever anticipated it would. This detonation proved to be three times more powerful than the scientists had anticipated. And they all had to go below deck and shelter on these naval vessels 30 miles away because so much radioactive fallout was, was falling in the area. This weapon was a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And they were completely surprised by the amount of lethal radioactive fallout that this detonation created. They went back to Washington, D.C. after this weapons test and realized that one hydrogen bomb of this power dropped on the Capitol building in Washington would kill everybody in Washington, D.C., everybody in Baltimore, the entire population of Philadelphia, and half the population of New York City. One nuclear weapon. So that's about 1954. Within a decade of the test of that hydrogen bomb, the United States had approximately 
32,000 nuclear weapons. There had been studies done in the late 1940s at the Pentagon that were trying to figure out, well, how many nuclear weapons do we need to hit the Soviet Union with in order to destroy it permanently as a functioning society? And those studies calculated perhaps 150 to 200 atomic bombs, like the kind that destroyed Hiroshima, a fraction of the power of hydrogen bombs. So in around 1948, we thought we needed 150 to 200, and yet 20 years later, less than 20 years later, we had 32,000. I spoke to former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who was head of the Pentagon when our arsenal reached its peak, and I asked him, how is it possible that you thought you needed 150 to 200 and you wound up with 32,000, most of them vastly more powerful than the type that you only thought you needed 150 of? And he said, well, Eric, if you want to understand the nuclear arms race that we had with the Soviet Union, this is pretty much how it worked. Each step seemed perfectly logical at the time, and step by step by step led to a place of total madness. Now, once you have 32,000 nuclear weapons, it is an extraordinary challenge just to know where they all are. Uh, if you're running uh, a large electronics warehouse and you have 32,000 flat screen TVs and you lose 10 of them to theft, you're doing an incredibly good job of inventory control. But with nuclear weapons, you can't afford to lose one of them, let alone 10 of them. So for the management managers of the American nuclear arsenal, this was a constant struggle to know where our weapons are, who's got them, and what they might be used for. The military wanted weapons that were always available for immediate use. If it looked like the United States was under attack, they wanted to be able to use their nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union. And they wanted nuclear weapons that always worked perfectly, that were perfectly reliable. Because if you sent a bomber crew all the way to the Soviet Union to get through air defenses and risk their lives to attack the Soviets, you didn't want them to drop a weapon that would be a dud. So the military wanted things that were always available and would always work. But during peacetime, the civilian leadership of the United States wanted nuclear weapons that would never go off by accident, would never be stolen or sabotaged, and would never be used by one of our officers without the proper authorization. And the tricky thing is, the very mechanisms that you need, both technological and administrative, to guarantee always are often exactly the opposite of the mechanisms you need to guarantee never. So again and again in this history, you see decisions being made to guarantee always, which meant decisions being made that could je jeopardize the safety and security of anywhere near, anyone near these nuclear weapons. And I look in my book at accidents that occurred with our own weapons that nearly destroyed major cities and states in America. Uh, not long after the Kennedy administration took office, we had a hydrogen bomb fall from a bomber accidentally that nearly destroyed uh, the state of North Carolina. And it would have put radioactive fallout all the way up to Washington, D.C., just a few days after John F. Kennedy's inauguration. I write about accidents in which uh, uh, a workman is trying to repair an intruder alarm at a missile site, and he opens the fuse box. He, basically, the burglar alarm isn't working properly, and he's pulling out one fuse after another, and he's using a screwdriver instead of a fuse puller, and he pulls out a fuse, and he's very surprised by the very loud explosion that he hears when he pulls out a fuse. And what he had done is created a short circuit that launched the warhead off the top of a missile. And the warhead didn't detonate, but it could have. 
the central narrative of my book is about a workman who was doing routine maintenance at a missile site on a missile, and he dropped a tool. The socket fell off of his wrench, fell about 80 feet, hit the silo wall, ricocheted, hit the side of this huge missile, pierced its skin, and suddenly thousands of gallons of highly explosive rocket fuel was filling the, the silo. And this was a problem because on top of this missile was the most powerful nuclear warhead the United States ever built. And we've forgotten how powerful these weapons could be. That one warhead on that one missile was more than three times as powerful as all the bombs used by all the militaries in the Second World War combined, including both atomic bombs. So when you think of the rubble throughout Europe, and you think of the devastation of wartime Japan, one nuclear weapon three times more powerful than all those explosions. And in the story I write about in the book, the Air Force had no idea what to do once this fuel leak had begun. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And there was a very desperate attempt to save the missile and prevent that warhead from being lost and destroying the state of Arkansas. Now, we now know that didn't happen. Arkansas is there. Bill Clinton became president. He might not have because he was the young governor of that state, and his daughter Chelsea was a one-year-old baby, and they could have been killed in that explosion. But when you look at the Cold War, it's a series of events, inadvertent and deliberate, that could easily have led not just to the destruction of major cities, but quite literally to the destruction of most of mankind. I interviewed top Pentagon officials. I interviewed weapons designers. I interviewed bomber pilots, missile crews, nuclear weapons repairmen. And again and again, I heard from them, it's almost miraculous that no city has been destroyed by a nuclear weapon since Nagasaki in 1945. They cannot believe it hasn't happened. And I wish I could say to you that my book is purely of historical interest. But if you read the paper, you can read about what's been happening with the American arsenal just in the last year. Missile officers caught using illegal drugs. Missile officers caught cheating on proficiency exams and trading the answers to exams via text message, essentially sending classified information over unsecured uh, communication systems. Uh, missile uh, blast doors that won't close, aging computers. And I'm very critical of the management of the American arsenal, but allow me to be jingoistic for a second. We invented this technology. We perfected it. We have more experience dealing with this technology than any other nation. And if we have come this close again and again to blowing ourselves up, think about other countries that don't have the same technological proficiency, that are seeking these machines. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, having spent now seven years immersed in this subject, I don't feel apocalyptic. I don't think we're doomed, but I'm very, very concerned. And I wrote this book in the interest of enlightening people and enlightening an entire generation who knows almost nothing about it. These machines are out there, about 16 to 17,000 of them. They are very dangerous, and we need to confront that reality. If you, if you look honestly at how close we came to catastrophe during the Cold War, and you really acknowledge we were lucky, we should also be worried about this fact. The problem with luck is eventually it runs out. So on that note, <laughs> I look forward to continuing the conversation. And at the very least, by looking at the subject of nuclear weapons, it's a great encouragement to enjoying the day. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, just as you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Um, that was, uh, of, of course, fascinating, and I read the book, and my copy is scribbled all over with comments. Um, there, are, there are a number of things I might start, because they want to listen to you, not me, but just to start it rolling. Well, just, just as a piece of advice, if you want to gear up your emotions about this subject, it's well worth watching again Dr. Strangelove, <laughs> and also a lesser-known film, but I think one of the most intelligent on the subject, because it's about honourable men, which is something I want to come back to, which is Crimson Tide, which is a film made after the end of the Cold War about the sort of dangers we could face now the Cold War's over. Um, American submarine film. But um, there are various points. I mean, I talk to people about this, and they say, well, it didn't happen, so that means it was all right, the systems worked, which, of course, as you say, luck has a, doesn't always run out, but it can, and that, I don't think, is a very good argument. Um, there's the whole question, which you sort of touched on, and you touch on a bit in the book, but the Soviet side of the story. I mean, they were the other side of the story, and we don't actually know as much about them, their procedures, what uh, the emotions that drove them, as we would like to. But I, the point I think I most want to make, which you also touched on, and I think people need to, to know that, because in the debate that's gone over, over the years, there has been a tendency to cast the protagonists as villains or patriots or whatever. If you talk to these people, and some of them are my colleagues, and you've talked to many more more recently, is that most of these people were, I was going to say honourable men, they were men actually mostly, uh, they were honourable, patriotic, decent men who were actually concerned about their own families. They didn't want to die either. And they were trapped in this hideous dilemma. The stuff has been invented. It's never going to be uninvented. It's there. If we don't have it, they'll get it. We must get it and we must find ways of managing it and then we must find ways of not using it. And these were actually, they were decent men. And you've described, I thought what you said about the people you met is fascinating. These were decent men who were really worried about doing what they felt they had no option but to do. And I think that's something when, you, when one deals with this subject, one needs to bear it in mind if you're going to understand the nature of the problem. Hmm. I found that to be true. I mean, I, I was in Hyde Park in 1982 with the CND demonstrations, and I never anticipated that 30, 25 years later, I would be in the living rooms and dining rooms of the very officials that I was marching against. And it gave me remarkable insight to realize that in the early 1980s, we were very worried about a nuclear war. Well, the people in charge were even more worried. And despite their public assurances to the contrary, uh, the level of stress and anxiety, and because of the secrecy, the fact that these men, and they were almost overwhelmingly men, would go to work, confront, for example, safety issues in the American arsenal. The weapons designers I, I interviewed were quite concerned that some of our weapons were prone to detonating inadvertently. And they were very worried about it. And they'd have to come home at night and be with their wives and children, unable to discuss any of this with them. And they lived with an awful knowledge. Now, Dr. Strangelove is a classic, classic film. One of, the, one of the most remarkable things about Dr. Strangelove is that it was a viciously attacked by the Air Force and the Pentagon when it was released for being absurd. Well, it was a farce, so of course it's absurd. But the Air Force and the Pentagon attacked it for saying it's absolutely impossible that a general on his own could launch a World War III. And the movie is completely factually inaccurate. We now know that Dr. Strangelove offers a more accurate description of the American command and control system of 1964 than anything you could have read in the mainstream media. And it wasn't, in truth, it wasn't until the early 1970s that locks with codes were put on American nuclear weapons and on American missiles. And what that means is that up until the early 1970s, if an American bomber crew had decided on its own to take off 
and go bomb Moscow with hydrogen bombs, or for that matter, bomb Chicago, there was nothing to prevent them. If two launch officers in the missile I described, the mammoth Titan II missile, with the most powerful warhead ever put on a missile in the United States, if two officers in one of those silos had decided to turn their keys and launch their missile, there was nothing that could have been done to prevent them. And this comes back to the earlier point. The only thing that prevented those sorts of events from happening was the professionalism, the discipline, the esprit de corps of those officers. And they were not, the one thing I don't like about Dr. Strangelove is it portrayed the American military officers as buffoons mm. and warmongers, eager to nuke the Soviet Union. Quite on the contrary, the officers I spent time with were profoundly aware of the weight of their responsibility, the consequences of their actions, and the fact that if there was a nuclear war, they, not only they would die, but most likely their families yeah. would as well. So the book is full of admiration for many of these people and stories of their heroism. And yet, as you said, they were trapped in this system and unable to find a way out. Well, it's an unfair question, really. But you said at the end that we need to confront the problem. And I'd be glad to know how we're going to do that. I have a theory, which is, I don't think, easy of application, which is that we should abolish testosterone, and that would help a great deal. <laughs> but I don't quite see how we're going to do that. Have you anything more practical to suggest? Yes. I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist, and I would not have spent seven years on this subject if I thought we were doomed. I would be surfing, kayaking, drinking heavily, and enjoying life. Let's look at it this way. In the year 2014, there are nine countries that have nuclear weapons. And there are perhaps 190 that don't. So it's not inevitable that every nation must have nuclear weapons. Not only that, the size of the American arsenal is about 80% lower than it was at the height of the Cold War. And the size of the Russian arsenal is about 90% lower than it was at the height of the Cold War. As recently as 30 or 40 years ago, there were fears that dozens of countries would get nuclear weapons. And the, uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and all kinds of other threats of sanctions have been very successful at preventing most countries from getting nuclear weapons. There is a, a growing awareness within the military in the United States that these weapons are useless as weapons that the whole thrust of military doctrine in the United States, whether it's fully carried out or not, is to minimize civilian casualties, to use precision weapons. And nuclear weapons are the opposite. Nuclear weapons are most useful for killing and terrorizing large numbers of civilians. So in Vienna, a couple of weeks from now, approximately 150 countries are going to be sending a delegations to discuss the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and the possibility of abolishing them. And I do believe there is the beginning of a new anti-nuclear movement and one that says these weapons are unacceptable because they violate the Geneva Convention. They are not going to be used against military targets. They're going to disproportionately be used to kill civilians in violation of international law. And we've got to try to do something about it. Well, I wish you luck, I have to say. But the, <laughs> but the, but the business of not using them against civilians uh, was, of course, part of the driving force of, amongst other things, under McNamara and Kennedy, to devise better ways of using them than just wiping out whole cities. So the idea was you were going to bust their silos. You were only going to go for military targets which is fine, and with the smartness of the latest missiles, you could do that. The only trouble is that a lot of people tend to live around those places. Right. So inadvertently, and you call it collateral damage, which is much easier than, say, you killed a lot of people, you do kill a lot of people, yeah. whatever. During, during the first Gulf War, when it looked like Saddam Hussein might use chemical weapons against American forces, General Colin Powell, who was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, instructed a study to be done about how we could use nuclear weapons on the battlefield to wipe out the Iraqi forces. 
And the conclusions of the study were that we shouldn't use nuclear weapons, not for moral or ethical reasons, but the collateral effects to our own forces, to the battlefield, were just not going to be worthwhile and that conventional weapons would be much more effective. So what the world needs to really think about in the 21st century is the whole notion of nuclear deterrence because the theory of nuclear deterrence essentially is I'm going to threaten to kill millions of your civilians to prevent you from killing millions of my civilians. The psychology is really like the hostage taking, a threat of hostage taking from the medieval era. And, and we've got to move beyond that as a form of international relations. And there's all kinds of arguments that will never move beyond that. But the reality is, if we don't, one day that deterrence is going to fail. Because nuclear deterrence isn't like a physical protection of your country. It's a psychological protection. It's an implied threat. And nuclear deterrence works very well until one day it doesn't. I, I wanted to uh, carry on with that. I think, first of all, uh, one has to make a distinction uh, between a, a worldwide confrontation between two nuclear powers, each of them capable of wiping out not only one another, but a whole lot of other people as well, and the sort of things that certainly could happen now, which would be um, local nuclear wars, if you kill a lot of people, but not, might not kill us. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's the first thing. Um, I think uh, that, so we need to think about that. I think the other thing I've forgotten, so well, let's deal with that question okay. first. Okay. Well, I, I think if you look at it in, in the levels of probability, and these are all low probability events, the most probable use of a nuclear weapon is going to be terrorists stealing a nuclear weapon or making their own and destroying a city somewhere in the world. That's the most likely mm -hmm. thing to happen. Mm -hmm. The second most likely thing to happen is a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan. In many ways, India and Pakistan are recreating the nuclear arms race the United States and the Soviet Union had, and yet there are some significant differences. We hated the Soviet Union, but we had the benefit of hating them from a long distance, and our hatred was largely theoretical. There's something about the hatred between neighbors even in the nicest suburban community, that can be far more intense. When you add religious differences, and when you add the fact that a missile launched from the continental United States to the Soviet Union was going to take a half hour to get there. So if the Soviet Union saw something on their <coughs> radar and they thought it was an American missile, they'd have time to figure out, well, is it a missile? Is it a mistake? Is it a reflection from the sun? Whereas the flight time of a missile between India and Pakistan is minutes. And so the time for decision making in a crisis is almost non-existent. And quite honestly, the way to win a nuclear war, the only conceivable way to win a nuclear war is to be the one to fire first. So in a real crisis situation, when India and Pakistan both go on heightened level of a nuclear alert, the pressure for both sides to be the first one to use nuclear weapons is going to be enormous. And we had situations like that between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Berlin crisis, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we were very lucky to get out without a nuclear war. Now, having said that the most likely nuclear war is between India and Pakistan, it doesn't mean that everyone else <coughs> in the world can breathe a sigh of relief. Because one of the unusual things about nuclear weapons and their effects is they have no consideration whatsoever for national boundaries. And there was a study done that last year which looked at, well, what will the effects be of a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan in which 100 or 200 nuclear weapons are used? And the study estimated the casualties worldwide would be around 1 billion people. 
and there would be famines and fallout and terrible effects. So there's only been two nuclear weapons used against popular areas. The idea of another one, let alone 100 or 200, is almost unimaginable, and we have to do everything we can to prevent that. Can I, because we must hand over to the, to the audience, but I'm just going to make one very parochial comment. Yeah. Of course, Russia and the Soviet Union and America were very far apart, unlike India and Pakistan. But it's one of the, when you read the American literature on the subject, it's a very introverted literature very often. It's Americans arguing with other work. Actually, we were here too. And uh, I remember, and Russia's not so far away from us, and they're a lot closer if you happen to be a German. Uh, but during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the BBC had one of their roving reporters at Charing Cross, I think, to talk to the commuters coming in. And I remember two exchanges. One was um, an American, obviously, and the, and the reporter said, don't you think your president's getting a bit overexcited about this stuff? And the American says, well, what would you think if foreign missiles were aimed at your capital city? So, well, of course, we'd been there already, and yeah. we were there even more by then because they probably did, could have hit us, so they couldn't have hit Washington. But the other one, which cheered me up a lot, was some lady, and they, he asked, you know, what do you think of this crisis, madam? And she said, oh, I don't know, dear. I'm only up in London for the day. <laughs> anyway, please, questions. Yeah. Um, I'll try and I'll go from left to right. You to start with. Thank you. Jeremy Kaplan from the Royal Society of Arts. My, my question is around the fact that you've defined that there's 150 states going to this <coughs> uh, discussion. But isn't that the fundamental issue, that um, the issue is not necessarily wars between states, but the whole issue of the terrorist network, which isn't state-bound and don't sign up to international laws or agreements, and the word deterrence and terror aren't that different when you look at the roots of them? Yeah, that is a, that is a great danger. But one of the things that world governments can do is not only try to advance towards disarmament, to gradually reducing the number of nuclear weapons that these countries have. And I mean, I, I support the abolition of nuclear weapons. I don't expect to see it next week, but I really do believe that the fewer weapons there are in the world, the less likely one will be used. And it's relevant when you get to concerns about terrorism because it's world governments that must play the leading role in protecting nuclear weapons from theft and also protecting bomb-grade fissile material from theft. And uh, there have been these nuclear security conferences held every two years where internationally huge steps have been made just in the last 10 years at locking up as much of this stuff as possible. But if you're concerned about terrorism, what that means is making it extremely difficult for terrorists to get the things they need to make one of these weapons. I think you were next. Uh, Nick James. Um, thanks very much, a fascinating lecture. Um, I wonder, you, you put the point that the risk of simply identifying, managing and controlling the arsenals is, is very high. And you make the point that we're on the edge of our capability of doing that. Uh, trying to look for a crumb of comfort. At the end of the Cold War, the other protagonist was Russia. And in the aftermath of the Cold War, they suffered substantial degradation in the technology, the discipline, and the administration of, of everything. Could we take a little bit of comfort that there's perhaps a little bit of tolerance in the system that they accommodated that without blowing themselves or anyone else up? <coughs> we can take comfort, but that change just didn't occur. It occurred because there was profound concern about the Russian arsenal after the end of the Cold War, and billions of dollars of Western money were spent uh, putting locks on the doors of Russian arsenals and accounting for their plutonium and bomb-grade uranium. Uh, it's not quite appreciated how dangerous things really were. Uh, when there was the coup attempt against President Gorbachev, the three handheld devices that controlled the Soviet arsenal fell into the hands 
of the coup plotters. And for three days, uh, Gorbachev was no longer in control of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. And if those uh, rebel officers had wanted to launch nuclear weapons, they could have. And that event caused profound fear at the highest levels of the United States government. And President George H.W. Bush did a remarkably good job in that period of bringing the level of tension way down, of announcing unilaterally that the United States was going to eliminate an entire category of our nuclear weapons from Europe, our tactical weapons. But at that point, there was huge concern about what would happen to the Soviet weapons, and billions of dollars were spent. And it's a rare instance of very close cooperation between the United States and then Russia to track these things down, lock them up, get them out of the Ukraine, get them out of Belarus. And uh, it's a story that's only been told in recent years, but we came very close to having nuclear weapons fall into the hands of rogue, uh, rogue elements. So again, you know, it gets back to what you said. There, there's this complacency, while it didn't happen, everything's OK. The problem is, you know, when it comes to the laws of probability, if the probability of something happening is greater than zero, that means it's going to happen. It could happen a million years from now, or it could happen tomorrow afternoon at 3. And I, I, I grew up in New York City. Uh, I was on top of the World Trade Center not long after it was completed. I was on top of the World Trade Center just weeks before both towers came down. If you had said to me on September 10th, the day before September 11th, Eric, tomorrow both of those buildings are going to be brought down. And they're going to be brought down by 18 or 19 guys with box cutters, with no other weapons basically than razor blades. Would that have seemed plausible or conceivable? Those were the biggest buildings in New York City, and they covered 16 acres of ground. And I used my journalist credentials to go down there that night, and I saw it with my own eyes. And we need to have the imagination to look beyond conventional thinking and look really clearly at the threats that we face. And not being overwhelmed by them, not feeling that it's hopeless. My background academically is history. And I always rejected, <coughs> while studying history, all of the different theories of historical inevitability, whether they were Marxist or all kinds of idealist theories of history. And the beauty is, if things aren't inevitable, then things don't have to be the way they are. And we are somehow empowered to prevent these sorts of catastrophes. But my, my concern right now, my greatest concern, is not the threat of terrorists making a weapon, is not the threat that Russia is going to provoke a new nuclear war because of Ukraine. The thing that is most concerning to me is the level of complacency and the lack of awareness and the lack of any real public debate about what I consider is the greatest threat that we face. I think, was there somebody? Can I take you at the back there and then I'll try and, we've got another, we've got 10 minutes, more than 10 can minutes. Can I just take you back to Russia for a moment and ask you the degree to which you think um, nowadays uh, both in Washington and in Moscow, similar sorts of conversation are had, uh, like the ones that you've been describing in the 1960s. Um, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. There are all kinds of challenges to the command and control of nuclear weapons today that didn't even exist 20 years ago, let alone <coughs> 50 years ago. And this sounds like a terrible plot for a crap Hollywood movie. But there is a real genuine concern about the vulnerability of our nuclear command and control systems to cyber attack. Uh, a few years ago, 50 
Minuteman III missiles in the United States suddenly went offline. And what that means is the launch crews could no longer communicate with their missiles, 50. And it took about an hour to regain communications and control of these missiles. Uh, the Air Force denied vehemently in public that there had been a cyber attack on our system. And what was discovered is that a computer chip had been improperly installed and through vibration had come out of a circuit board and that's what had shut down communication with the missiles. Privately, the Air Force became deeply concerned about the vulnerability of their system to some sort of cyber attack. And it's a real concern, uh, particularly from an insider within the system. You know, Edward Snowden, a low-level private contractor at the NSA who was able to get access to the most top secret secrets of the most top secret intelligence agency the United States has, <coughs> and the NSA is also responsible for our nuclear launch codes and for the cryptographic equipment that decodes those codes. And there's no evidence that Edward Snowden got into our nuclear command and control system, but there's concerned someone else might. Uh, there's concerned about the security of the Russian and Chinese nuclear command and control systems. There's a huge incentive in a nuclear rivalry to get into your adversary's command and control system. During the Cold War, to eliminate the Soviet threat, we would have had to hit every one of their silos with a warhead, very precisely. In the 21st century, maybe you just need to shut down their whole system with a virus. And there's a huge incentive for nations and for rogue elements to figure out how to do that. So there's been, there's been all kinds of problems with our, uh, our nuclear forces in just the last year. And as long as these weapons exist, fully assembled, ready to be used on a moment's notice, the people in charge of them, I hope, are occasionally having trouble sleeping at night. I think we've got very little time left, am I right? A couple of minutes. Can I take two questions together? You and there was a gentleman over there? You. So two questions together, very quickly if you don't mind. Um, the need for all these nuclear weapon systems uh, depends on the lack of trust between people. What can we do to increase the levels of trust between nations, between people, to avoid such disasters? And you please, let's, shall we take these two? Yeah. yeah. Um, in the, uh, the, the main part of the book, the, the politicians uh, at least had come from a situation where they had been involved probably in the Second World War in some way or other. But the current generation of politicians, certainly in the West, have no experience of warfare really at all, apart from reading it in the papers or watching it on TV. So do you think that is actually a problem in terms of actually trying to look at decommissioning all these weapons? It's a big problem. So two political questions. And the subset of that problem is that the officers in charge of nuclear weapons, both in the United States and Russia, have never had to go, go through a nuclear crisis. <coughs> uh, during the Cold War, you had real, not only World War II veterans in charge of the nuclear forces on both sides, but they had gone through the crisis surrounding the Hungarian invasion. They had gone through the Berlin crisis. They had gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they knew how to operate under very tense situations. Uh, the officers in charge today have none of that experience, are inexperienced, and that can lead to mistakes. The, the only thing I can say about how to develop trust between nations is to fight against the impulse that politicians throughout the world have of creating foreign enemies in order to rally domestic support. And that is just the first sign of a rogue. And leaders do it again and again. And they do it to the great disservice of their own people.
Thank you very much. I think that's a very good note to end on. I think we're on time, are we? Can I ask you all to give a round of applause for... Thank you very much. Thank you very much.